it's gay panic in ancient China, guys. All right, this is uh, going to be basically a big old uh, warning and please forgive me. I'm going to be saying and using a lot of Mandarin names and terms. And guys, I am not smart enough to learn Chinese or Mandarin. I don't have the brain for it. It's a beautifully complex language and I'm dumb. <laughs> I did look up how to say these words and these terms and I have tried to practice, but I am also a dumb white Westerner and freely admit that my pronunciation is probably going to be very off or fucked up in many cases, especially as I say things multiple times and screw up there. Please forgive me. I did try. Oh, also if you hear any noise in the background, it's because Peg is somewhere around here chewing on a bone and I have my nephew who is a nearly 60 pound bully mix around as well and he's extremely needy so I'm sure he will interrupt me at some point. So today I want to talk about not a book, well maybe kind of a book, not a K-drama. We're talking about a C-drama. I know you're all so excited. A C-drama as you can guess similar to a K-drama is script television from China. In fact I want to talk about a very particular C-drama that really has become a bit of a global phenomenon and has done extremely well with foreigners for a good reason. And that is the drama Chen Tiangliang, which translates as The Untamed. That's its English title, at least. I cannot tell you if that is an exact translation. Please don't ask. I don't know Mandarin. This is, as I said, a supremely popular, well-known, well-loved Xiangxia fantasy show that is based upon a supremely popular, pretty well-known, well-beloved Xiangxia boy love fantasy web novel entitled Mo Tao Zhu Shi, which translates as the Grand Master of Demonic Cultivation. I want that on my headstone when I die, or I want it as a plaque on my door. Now, <laughs> we've mentioned some words and, and terms. Let's, let's talk about them. First, Xiangxia fantasy, what is that? Xianxia is a subgenre of Chinese fantasy. It can be often very easily confused with the probably more well-known wuxia fantasy subgenre. Uh, and here's the best way I have found to, in a very, very reductive, simplistic manner, explain the differences. Xianxia is high fantasy, wuxia is more of a low fantasy. Which is still pretty high fantasy, to be honest, if I'm going to get comparative. But I guess in the scope of Chinese fantasy literature, that's sort of how they rank. Wuxia fantasy also very specifically has the magic or the fantasy related to martial arts. In fact, I do believe in terms of like wuxia, the wu I do believe stands for like martial arts. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm remembering that correctly. Xianxia fantasy, the high fantasy, takes its basis in a lot of Chinese mythology, a lot of like Buddhist, Taoist principles and ideas, the practice, a lot of times the cultivation based magic system is rooted in Qigong, which I had to look up because I had no idea what that was. Oh my god, Peg, are you really doing this right, right near the microphone. And often the magic users are cultivating like spiritual energy or energy of the world around them and in doing so can get things like magic powers can possibly extend their lives become maybe even immortal can achieve almost like a godlike status kind of depends on the writer in question and where they want to go with this in the case of Mo Tzu Shi and later Chang Chen Qingliang. I really should just call it the untamed guys uh Mo Tzu Shi I feel more confident in saying and I'm still probably saying it wrong so we're just gonna refer to the show as The Untamed. I apologize to everybody who loves its original name. In the case of The Untamed and its basis novel, it is the cultivation of the most of the positive spiritual energy around, often using that to disperse negative energy. And if you start fucking with negative spiritual energy, it's actually like those who are spirits with a lot of grudges, which is something that's very common I've found now in at least Chinese and Korean stories involving like the afterlife and ghosts. Like if you died in a way that feels unjust, like your spirit has a grudge and it just like hangs out, causes problems, wreaks havoc, upsets the natural balance. It's actually really cool. I'm a big fan. If you start trying to 
harness and work with this negative energy, you fall into demonic cultivation as our male main character does. Though he would even say he's not technically working with demons. And in fact, the show makes a point of defining what like a demon is. He's kind of doing more like spiritual cultivation because he's working directly with spiritual energy. It's not just like the energy of the world around him or coming from his golden core within. Like he is legit going, yo spirit, let's roll. So that is sort of the magic system of the untamed in an extremely reductive, simplistic way. Please nobody come for me. <laughs> I will say that in the case of the Untamed, most of this work is done with swords and there is some work with talismans, but when our primary male character comes in to start working his spirit cultivation, his demonic cultivation, he primarily uses a flute. It is in fact a titsu flute. I do believe I've said that correctly. Please nobody come for me, which is a transverse bamboo flute. Uh, in case you're curious, transverse means you hold it like this the way one would like a European flute. And he does also continue his work with talismans as well. The other thing we need to talk about is I mentioned the source material is boy love. Uh, and that is sort of what it gets called. It basically means we're looking at a queer love story between two men, our two main male characters in the novel are explicitly gay. They are in a gay romance, like the entire <laughs> last chapter is them just having like graphic sex in the woods. That's not even a joke, I'm being dead serious. And they actually get married. Like, they are partners for life. They get married. The show, however, because this is a Chinese television series, has to brush up against Chinese censorship. Now, in case you don't know, Chinese censorship as it pertains to the LGBTQ plus community is uh, very strict. Basically, you can't have it. And even though this show is several years old, I think it was done in like 2018, 2019, I could be wrong, but I think it was around like 2018 doesn't matter. There's actually a, another very, right now, very popular show that I think has finished airing in China, but is still airing internationally, or at least in the West, I'm not entirely sure, entitled Word of Honor. This is another adaptation of a supremely popular boy love, this time wuxia fantasy novel, or web novel, sorry. And uh, they actually brushed up against the censors. They had to go perform ADR, which is additional dialogue replacement. Basically, you go into a booth in post-production and re-record your dialogue. In their case, they had to replace dialogue. They actually had to change the dialogue. And there's a phenomenal account here on YouTube entitled, I believe it's Avenue X. I'm gonna link her down below. And she has this really fun series called Lip Reading for Sugar, where she found all these moments of ADR and she makes out what the original line was, compares it with the line that you actually hear and talks about like why one had to be changed versus the other. And she also has a couple really good videos on the Untamed and I just highly recommend her. She's gonna be far more authoritative on probably any of these topics than I am. And she's also very entertaining. So I'll link her down below in case you're curious. So you have something like Word of Honor that's popping up against the censors. And as far as I could tell, the Untamed didn't really get into much trouble with the censors. They obviously, the writers were supremely careful in their adaptation. And actually, according to Avenue X, uh, they got away with a lot. Like even she talks about how surprised she was with how much they got away with. It's, it's like they weren't flirting with the line. They weren't up against the line. They were on the line. Like had they put one hair out of place, they were they would have been so over the line. They definitely would have been censored or like hit up to like, you need to change shit. They got away with a lot, which honestly in watching it, there's no way you can mistake this is a queer love story for several reasons. Yes, all of the explicit I love yous, any kissing, physical contact, graphic sex is reduced to, to what we're gonna call homoerotic subtext as well as a lot of queer coding. But there is no doubting all of this angst and these emotions and these things, there's no doubting this is a love story. You can never for one second doubt it's a love story. In fact, these characters call each other their soulmate for life. And I've now discovered apparently you can get away with saying the word soulmate, but I think that is because it comes up with a lot of potential translations you can use. In fact, in all of the different platforms I've now like hunted that particular scene on, I've seen it translated many different ways between like bosom buddies, which God, I, I actually really hate that phrase. Don't ask me why, this is just a me thing. I hate that phrase to um, uh, confidant for life or life confidant. It is soulmate. I checked <laughs> the best that I could again as somebody who's 
in no way an expert on Mandarin, from what I gathered, the word that was used, they literally call each other, like, I saw you as my soulmate for life. <laughs> they be married. <laughs> like, legitimately. They be married. Therefore, in the end, I wasn't left, like, disappointed. I personally didn't feel, like, deprived of a lot. Like, would I have minded getting an I love you? Or maybe, like, there were a couple moments where I was like, ooh, kiss! <laughs> like, that'd be nice. In general, I was actually okay. But as somebody who prefers slightly more ace-friendly content, um, I didn't need the chapter of graphic sex to be shown to me. I didn't need a lot of that because ultimately this is still an extremely emotional and intimate show that like, I personally didn't feel like I was lacking. Others might, that's my personal opinion. I, it's one of those things where I'm sad that they were censored and this is the route they had to go. But I also think it really made the writers work so hard to bring that emotional intimacy and also the actors have to bring it. But I do think the writers did such a stellar- <laughs> Really, Peg? She's chewing a bone, so she's coughing on it. I think the writers did such a stellar job, and I think it honestly made them have to be so much more clever and work all the harder to really bring you this relationship when you don't have the benefit of, I guess you'd call it an easy out, of like physical contact and, and direct words of affection. Instead, they gave us 50 episodes of how to say I love you without actually saying I love you. It's amazing. But let's do some more defining. What is homoerotic subtext and queer coding? So homoerotic subtext, homoeroticism, it's basically attraction between two members of the same sex, whether it be male, male, or female, female. But the difference between that and say like homosexual content is that there is no sexual content. Like these people have all the feelings, but they don't physically act on them. Best way I can describe it. And of course, we need to talk about queer coding. Now, queer coding is a pretty um, fraught subject by this point. Now, queer coding in general, it's a neutral term that refers to basically subtextual elements. So like traits, behaviors, dressing, everything else that suggests a character is somehow queer. They are somehow under the rainbow flag, as we will. Now, in general, I say this is a fraught subject because you'll hear it brought up a lot, especially with relation to Disney films and their villains, and hence it is a fraught topic because the issue is the characters who are often queer coded are villains. They are the antagonists. So it's like, really, why are you queer coding the villains? But obviously the heroes are hella heterosexual. Well, the untamed avoids this issue of pairing queerness with antagonism and evil and the bad by basically queer coding everyone good bad morally gray the entire spectrum of where you go from good to bad they are all queer coded like i i i cannot tell you how queer coded this is and again you can get away with the queer coding but you're not explicitly saying they're gay you're just portraying them in every way as queer why is this a good thing in the untamed whereas like disney does it the bad way again i mentioned the untamed queer codes, everyone. There are very few people that look at and go, you are a heterosexual. Most of these, I'm like, you are chaotic, bisexual, or gay. In fact, I nicknamed most of the characters related to that because I was loving it so much. But the good thing about that is that it normalizes it. It basically feels like being queer or this queerness is normal in the world of the untamed. A concept, guys. A fucking concept. And it, in fact, bolsters the fact that we are trying to tell a queer love story without saying we're telling a queer love story. Like chef kisses. It's beautiful. I really cannot tell you how beautiful. I actually watched something and went, this is queer coded as fuck and it's done for good. It is done for good. And like, I really cannot stress how every character is queer coded. From our chaotic bisexual male lead to the kind of emotionally repressed for most of it, gay, gay male other lead, to a chaotic, evil, psychotic, like antagonist, so gay for a good guy. Oh my God. He's my trash child and I love him. I should really just say this entire show is filled with my trash children and I love them. And normally I say that about villains, but oh no, I love almost everyone in this show, except for like one character. I'm calling him Hat Guy. So as I said, gay panic in ancient China, and it's amazing. As you can guess, I love the characters of this show. So 
Me trying to talk about this show, whether it comes to the plot or the characters, will be very hard. Because one, there are a lot of characters. Two, it's a pretty big plot. And the characters in the plot are so inextricably linked. And that is why I think this show is so good. I mean, not only it's a fabulous adaptation, the writers did a lot with having to adapt an explicit gay romance and turn it all into queer coding and homoerotic subtext and some clever cultural things that I did not know. And when I looked them up, I loved it even more. It was great. But you also have a story that at its core, yes, it is a love story, but it's also a story about human nature and why humans do the things they do, how they become the people they ultimately are as adults. It's a big, big, big treatise on nature and nurture and how both of them are so important. And so let's just start with our male lead, Wei Wuxian. Now, a note about names. One, I will probably fuck them all up. Two, uh, most of these characters have two to three names. There is the birth name, the courtesy name, and sometimes they have like a title that they go by. So in the case of Wei Wuxian, Wei Wuxian is his courtesy name. Wei Ying is his birth name. Very few people use this. It is a very intimate thing to use the birth name. From what I gathered, at least in this show, that is how it seemed. In fact, the only people who call him Wei Ying are his adoptive family slash siblings and his love interest. They are the only ones who call him by his birth name. Everyone else will pretty much use his courtesy name of Wei Wuxian. Now, he does end up getting the title of the Yiling Patriarch, and some people will refer to him as that. Now his love interest, this is Lan Wangji, who I'm probably gonna call Lan Chan for most of this because Lan Chan is his birth name and Wei Wuxian tends to call him Lan Chan for like the entirety of the thing. He very rarely calls him Lan Wangji or his title, Han Guanjun. Please don't ask me what Han Guanjun stands for. I actually don't know. It wasn't translated in the Netflix subtitles. So frankly, I just rolled with it. Wei Wuxian, the self-titled Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation, Yiling Patriarch Wei Yang, is chaotic and bisexual, confirmed in the show. I would like to add, there's a line of dialogue that straight out confirms he's bisexual, which again, how they got away with that, I don't know. Wei Wuxian is a character that probably, if you do those like, chaotic, neutral, those um, like good, neutral, evil, chaotic, whatever kind of things. Uh, those like grids. He would be chaotic good. He's a character who's actually introduced to basically be the boogeyman. I think the construction of the first episode is actually quite brilliant. And I think it sets up the story we're gonna tell so well. We start on a battlefield in what looks like hell. I mean, literally like think Mount Doom, Mustafar, hell. We later find out this is a place called Nightless City, which I looked around going, do you motherfuckers see the sun? Do you see the sun? This looks like hell. And we hear this dialogue of people saying, Wei Wuxian is dead. The Yiling Patriarch is dead. Like this is a good thing. They say, oh, he betrayed his family and got them killed. And you're like, oh shit. You know, he's into this wicked cultivation. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> oh man. But then we open, the first shot we see is a man crying. And we come to realize this man, who's clearly emotionally having a breakdown, is Wei Wuxian. And in fact, we watch him die. He actually commits suicide. He literally goes like this over the edge of a cliff while everybody else is chasing after something called the Stygian Tiger Amulet. Now, a note about translation. I don't know how accurate that is because Stygian is actually, as far as I know, a Greek word. Stygian basically means related to the river Styx, so related to death. It was translated as the Stygian Tiger Amulet. This is what I'm gonna refer to it as. Wei Wuxian basically is standing at the edge of this cliff and we see Lan Chan, Lan Wanji, shows up and he says Wei Ying, using the intimate birth <laughs> name. Yeah, I know you're not sorry for coughing in the middle of my thing. Lan Zhan manages to grab him and is holding on to him. But then we see another character approach. This is Jiang Chang. Jiang Chang is Wei Wuxian's adoptive younger brother. And he's the one who they say got the credit for killing him. We see him say like Wei Ying, Wei Wuxian, sorry. He says, Wei Wuxian, go to hell. And you're like, oh! Well, we did hear he kind of got family killed. So there's a grudge here. 
stabs the sword. And next thing we see Wei Wuxian falling down. And so you have this dichotomy of hearing that this guy is basically the fucking boogeyman. And you're like, everybody's happy he's dead. And apparently he's terrible. They're all chasing after this amulet. They're all dying for this amulet that looks, you know, evil. Because it's got like dark shadows and shit following it. And you're like, well, that can't be a good thing. <laughs> I ain't fucking with that. But you see this character, the character in question basically looks so sad and devastated. And you have this other character who, if we're going to talk about color coding, Lan Zhan tends to traditionally wear white. Wei Wuxian wears an awful lot of black. So I think even down to the Western, white hat and black hat. I'm like, dude, the white hat's trying to save the black hat, which tells me, is the black hat really a black hat? Is he bad? Hmm, what's going on here? And we close that out and we flash. 16 years into the future. We hear some more stories about the Yiling Patriarch, who we understand is Wei Wuxian. So again, we're describing him as the fucking boogeyman. And I'm sitting here going, uh-huh. You know that means he's not actually the boogeyman. And most of this is probably not true. But hey. And they even say like, oh, but he died, didn't he? And it's like, well, they never did find his body. Number one rule of fantasy. You always need to see the body or you cannot guarantee that character is dead. So, of course, who wakes up but Wei Wuxian? He wakes up. He's surrounded by these paper talismans. He has no idea where he is. He's being told he's someone called Mo, Sh Mo Shuan, Shuan Yu. Shuan Yu? Someone will correct me. And he's just like, what? And next thing you know, people are barging in. They're beating him. And then they leave. And he's just like, okay, I don't know what's going on. We quickly come to realize that Mo Shuan Yu performed something called a sacrifice summon. Because that sounds like a good time. And effectually sacrificed his body and soul to bring Wei Wuxian's soul back from the dead or wherever the heck it was hanging out to fulfill a vengeance for him. And so what we see on Wei Wuxian's body is we see that on his arm he has these essentially open wounds. They look like slash marks and he has to fulfill the vengeance that was, you know, requested of him. He effectually needs to kill these people who have wronged Moshu on you, and then these wounds will close. If he doesn't do it, uh, those wounds are just going to remain forever open. He will likely die from infection, blood loss, who knows what, and his soul will basically be destroyed forever. He will never get a chance at reincarnation, which is a big deal. I mean, Mo Yu basically sacrificed his own potential reincarnation. He destroyed his own soul to make this happen. So, like, dude was pissed. And so Wei Wuxian, because... Most of these people, he's like, he can't guarantee they know what he looked like. And he starts off basically trying to find out, okay, why did I get brought back? What's happened in 16 years? And in fact, and okay. This goes on for the first episode and about, I don't know, two thirds of the way through the second episode. At which point we then flash back because we've now seen him interact with Jian Chang. He's interacted again with Lan Zhan and it's a beautiful scene. It's one of my favorites. I have rewatched it far too many times with the child who is effectively his nephew and basically the next generation of young cultivators who are coming up and they're all teens. The baby gays are all here. And these are very emotionally charged interactions. So you're left wondering, what actually happened? Like we think we've seen it. We saw what happened when he died. In fact, we have not. We didn't even get the entirety of that scene in that first episode by design. They showed us all they wanted us to see in that moment because then we were gonna flash back 16 years into the past, find out what these relationships were, how he and Lan Zhan met, how that relationship developed, what happened between him and Jian Chang. How did he end up yeeting himself off a cliff in Nightless City? And that goes on for over half of the show. And it's wonderful. It is one of the few times a story is told for the bulk of it almost entirely in flashback. And I was very okay with it because the show in episodes one, especially, and in parts of episode two, has already intrigued you with, there is a history. What is this history? And then they decide to just show you the history. And in doing so, when they then come back to where we basically left off 16 years later, we're like, wow, we now have the context for everything that happened in those first two episodes. Oh, I get it. But then also now I have so many questions because why was this dude brought back? What, how is the yin iron coming back? How is the Stygian tiger amulet back? Like, this can't be a coincidence that I came back and all these things happened. There are no quinky dinks here. None, this is fantasy. And the story that then takes place in these 16 years later 
is equally as good as the first one. Like, I was so emotionally invested in this show, and it has to do with the fact that I love these characters. And that, for over half the show, it's not even just character development, it's character relationships. And all of them very different. Family relationships, all the different kinds of those. Romantic relationships, all the different kinds of those. Pl beautiful platonic relationships. I mean, any relationship you can think of, you pretty much get it in this show, in all different forms of it. And again, I speak of how this is a show about human nature and why people do the things they do. As I said, we are presented Wei Ying as the boogeyman. He is not in fact the boogeyman, he's in fact very misunderstood. And he is playing with a dangerous cult form of cultivation. He knows it. But we find out why he chose to go this route and pick up what are called crafty tricks. And he even tries to talk with Lanjan about it and Lanjan says, let me help you because this really could kill you. Like you could screw up your mind, your body, your spirit, like all of it. Let me help you. Even while maybe not fully agreeing with or understanding it. You see how a rumor gets started and it grows and grows and grows. And by the time it's hitting everyone, nobody cares about the truth anymore. How war brings out the absolute worst in people and how sometimes the people who win do things that are as despicable as the initial aggressors who have lost. Victory does not guarantee that you will remain a good person. And also not only that, just because you have status doesn't mean you are a good person. In fact, most of the characters we would look at as good people, like genuinely good people, are not at the top of the totem pole. I mean, Wei Wuxian gets, as, gets built up and then comes crashing down. You think of the line from I, Tanya where it's like, America loves a hero, but they love even more watching a hero fall. Literally the story of Wei Wuxian. And also how people can become affected by their experiences. And I'm gonna use three characters to talk about that. One, Wei Wuxian. Two, Meng Yao. Hat guy. Yeah, you probably guess that's hat guy. And Shui Yang. These three characters are foils for each other. Three characters who have very similar beginnings and who take radically different paths in life. We've already kind of talked about Wei Wuxian. Ultimately, he upholds a principle of wanting to execute justice and be a good person. And he does that even if it risks him having to be, as he says, on the single log path, having to be alone with nobody beside him. That's ultimately what happens. And it's ultimately, sadly, part of his downfalls. He's willing to go against the establishment, the established order against people's prejudices and everything else and says, I don't give a fuck. That's not right, so I won't do it. That's ultimately what gets him in trouble. He had a good upbringing. He was orphaned as a young child. In fact, lived on the streets for a bit. He was then taken in by the Jiang clan. And by having this makeshift family, okay, Mama Jiang didn't really like him all that much, her aside. Daddy Jiang did. He had his sister and his brother who both loved him. And it's not just like he has a really fun bickering relationship with Yang Chang. Those two love each other, like would willingly sacrifice for each other, which they do. And it's hella tragic how they also have a habit of not telling each other that they're sacrificing for each other. And this leads to so many misunderstandings. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. And then he and his sister, his sister, by the way, who is a fucking queen and we love her. She's a literal goddess. There's a reason we love her, just trust me. And he has this good family network. He grows up in a good environment. The good nature is fostered within him. And so he comes up with this sense of justice and of wanting to always do good. But with the, also the understanding, you do harm unto me, I will do harm unto you. He's very much, I give as good as I get. Both ways, good and bad. You then have Meng Yao a bastard. I mean, in both senses of that word, he is in fact a bastard, but then he's also, you a bastard. Oh, it is literally all your fault. <sighs> it's all his fault. I cannot stress that enough. He's a bastard of the Jin clan. So I can't believe I'm using the word daddy. Daddy Jin, Jin patriarch, basically fucked another woman has, and they say he's got like a whole bunch of bastards running around. Like he was not into monogamy apparently. When he goes to basically get this makeshift family, he presents himself to his father saying like, hey, I'm a bastard. Like, I want to be brought into the fold, to be a cultivator, all these things. He's literally kicked down the steps of Carp Dart. Like, it's a long, painful looking fall. I admittedly didn't feel that bad for him by that point, but it sucks. So what happens? 
he realizes, okay, I need power in this world. I can't get it by being up front. And he thus learns to speak very well, hiding everything he's doing. The sort of catch more honeys with flies than, catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Wow. Wow, brain. And he becomes a supremely two-faced, devious character because he realizes only when they think he's useful will they bring him in. In fact, Daddy Jin only brings him in after, oh, you killed the Way Patriarch? Nice job. Yeah, you're totally my kid. I'm gonna treat you like, a... come on here, let's give you a courtesy name. And I'm like, look, I was sus of Meng Yao from the start. The moment they said he speaks well, I went, oh, that's sus. That's super sus. If you speak well, but I don't see you do much else. I'm sus. I'm super sus. And then we get Shui Yang. <laughs> My wonderful, psychotic, chaotic, evil trash child. You cannot understand the love I have for this character, even though like he is a garbage human and I love him so much though. Like, wow. His and I actually cried a little in his last scenes. Another character, orphaned at a young age. He had a supreme sweet tooth, so all he wanted was candy or someone to at least give it to him. And this authority figure for him didn't just kick him down a flight of stairs. Ran over his fucking hand with a cart. So here this kid is, I like small, like seven, eight, I think. He's really young. Hand crushed by a cart to the point that in fact his pinky never recovered. Like it was literally crushed to a pulp. You'll see him, he wears a, like this weird funky glove that covers his pinky and it's held forever up because he, he don't have one. The bones were all crushed. That's a traumatic experience upon a child. Like that is traumatic. Already also being orphaned and suffering verbal and physical abuse in other ways because you're orphaned and people are assholes. And then to have your hand crushed, like trauma. The tra and at that point you can tell his psyche becomes extremely fractured and that is why he becomes as psychotic and like batshit crazy as he is. And I love him for it because at the end of the day, he is still just a child who never really grew up. Instead, just became very impulsive and tends to go for his worst impulses because they produce results and he gives into his anger very easily. Three characters with similar beginnings of all being orphaned, running to an authority figure. Only one of them got positivity from that authority figure. That's Wei Wuxian. One of them got hurt and he's just like, well, fuck you, dad. I'm gonna fuck this shit up. And then you get the other one who has a small child experiences this trauma and therefore his psyche never recovers. Why do people do what they do? It's because of who they become. It is because of the experiences that are so formative to them. This is a show all about that. It's so good. It is about humanity. And that is probably why I was so riveted for 50 episodes. I mean, 50 episodes. I've been watching K-dramas, guys. One season. 16 episodes, sometimes a little more, not that often. 50 fucking episodes I watched start to finish, eyes glued to the screen. I cannot tell you how riveted I was because yes, the fantasy and the magic is great. If I'm going to harp on this show for anything, it'd be some technical details of the production. It'd be like, okay, like some of the effects are not fabulous. Some of the stunts could have been better, but I'm not mad. Because to me, that is so, like, that's window dressing. Because everything else is so good. The actual core of the show, the story, the characters, the themes it's trying to play upon, that is so good. And they are so interwoven together. And that is probably why of these fantasy shows, it's the one I've, these Chinese fantasy shows at least, it's the one I've enjoyed the most. Granted, again, I have not seen that many. I've watched Ashes of Love, I've watched this, and I've watched Word of Honor. But to me, the Untamed kind of has become the bar. I'm like, no, no, this is a five star. This is brilliant. This is me yelling at people to watch it. Also, it's just gay as fuck and it's oh, amazing. It is so goddamn gay, guys. I literally was telling all of my fellow like queer friends, I was like, guys, this is the gayest shit I have ever seen. And like, you will not get a single kiss, but it's the gayest shit I have ever seen. And it's amazing. The angst, you guys. I, I cannot stress how good the angst is. Your girl likes her angst when done well. This is done so well. Like I have never felt things so much for like 50 straight episodes. Also spending the whole time going, well, they're boyfriends. Well, they're in a committed relationship. Well, they're just fucking married. 
basically, long story short, I understand that foreign television is difficult for people, and especially if you're coming into something like K-dramas or C-dramas, which do have an element of style to them the same way that anime has stylistic elements to it. I think the reason this is so popular with a global audience is one, all of the good use of queer coding and the homoerotic subtext and undertones. Because it is being done with every character, because you have that, it actually ends up being very queer friendly. Kind of an irony when you consider they were doing this so that China didn't think they were gay. But you also end up with a very interesting story, like one, you get a really cool magic system you may not be familiar with, you get some really nice stunts, yes there's a lot of wire work involved, but you're gonna find if you've watched any sort of Asian content, especially Chinese content that is focused in either wuxia or xianxia, you have a lot of wire work. It's actually really cool. Think of it as a stylistic artistic element. It is designed to create a sense of beauty and it's really neat most of the time. You're going to get characters all across the spectrum of good, bad, morally gray, and they're gonna shift all the time and a story that ultimately is engaging because you have multiple antagonists with multiple motives, you're going across a long time frame, you are going to get all sorts of little subplots that all end up co like coming together. There's really no subplot that ever feels wasted. This is one of the few shows where I look at and I go, I don't think I would cut out any scenes. And this is 50 fucking episodes, guys. Like 50 episodes. And I'm sitting here going, no, I'd pretty much keep every scene. Yeah, they all ultimately end up being really important. I do think they streamlined the web novel extremely well. Because again, remember, this is being adapted from a web novel where it's like near daily updates. And again, it clocks in near like a thousand pages. It's seriously so long. It streamlines this so well, so beautifully. It's just a treat. It's a real enjoy. As long as, in the words of Pang Jun Ho, you can get over the one inch barrier of subtitles. <laughs>